Good afternoon, Melissa Ponzio. Welcome on VH Berries. Ah, oh, Victor, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. I am extremely grateful. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm really good today, thanks. I had um, breakfast for dinner, which is something that I love to do. It's a, it's a quick meal to have, and so my tummy's full, and so is my heart, and I'm really happy to be here, so thanks. In your background and in the room you're in, we can see some birds, some <laughs> butterflies, lamps, and also a little black box in which we can read, I can't afford to be a hipster. <laughs> You have really great eyesight. Um, yeah, we're in my we're in my like my spare room, but I also call it my girl room. And these are all um, paper kites that I have collected over the years, and they're all different. And I have some on the other walls that you can't see, and they bring me great joy. And um, I love to find them. They're bright bright colors, and you know, again, like you say, some are birds, some are bugs. Uh, I have a butterfly over there. And I also, you, ha you have very good eyes. Um, I collect banks. And so I have a lot of piggy banks around my house as well. Um, and that's one that my brother gave me uh, a couple of years ago that I love and I keep close. <laughs> Absolutely, Melissa Ponzio. I would love to discuss about your passion uh, for uh, collecting uh, some very precious objects, especially mm -hmm. when uh, exploring Atlanta City and going to estate sales. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Absolutely. Thanks for asking. Um, I guess this started a couple, uh, I mean, <laughs> it, it generated with my Aunt Faye. My Aunt Faye was a woman that loved to wear really bold colors, really bold patterns. She would have her hair done in a bouffant and just the giant flower or dangly earrings. And when I was a little girl, I just thought she was amazing. I just thought she was the most beautiful creature ever. And um, Nanny, my New York grandmother, also always dressed to the nines. So I had these ladies that were really just just decked out in all this costume sparkly jewelry and I guess it stuck with me because I collect vintage purses, vintage clothing, vintage jewelry, um, uh, vintage barware and so uh, sometimes when I'm in Atlanta or even in a different city, even overseas, I'll find places that maybe are really great thrift stores or um, you know secondhand stores or even estate sales here in the States And I go and I try to pick and I try to find something. And um, <laughs> usually <laughs> I'm one of those people that have like a little story about it. You know, I can kind of remember almost where everything I picked up. And um, it's a real joy, actually, Victor. Sometimes the families are there, the, maybe the person that's moving or have moved on or passed on. And I like to talk with them about the person that lived there in their life and and maybe if they have a memory about maybe a bracelet that that the person wore or a hat that they wore and if i have it um and then kind of i feel like maybe i'm taking a little bit of their energy on with me and then wherever i go they're with me and so um at least that's what i my little fantasy that i have and so um yeah it's a, it's a lifetime of collecting and it's all in this room and if and if you were here most people would be like wow that's a lot of stuff but it brings me great joy to have it all. <laughs> it is a lifetime of collecting. And the things that Melissa Ponzio um, is speaking um, always have a certain, as you just mentioned, energy to it. And it is now your responsibility when you're using those objects to feel the energy and to live with them. That's right. And, um, you know, you'd like to, I'd like to think that the, the person that I'm, I'm, I'm actually being given this from, you know, was a one of a kind person. And now their bracelet or whatever it is, the item that I'm taking, even cookware, um, you know, I'll be using somebody's, you know, like a spoon or a spatula or a really beautiful bowl. And I'll think all the times that they may have used this bowl during the holidays or, You know, um, maybe they made it for, uh, you know, maybe made a birthday cake in this particular, you know, thing. And, 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 and it's a one of a kind thing. And, and the dresses that I have or the jackets that I have, you know, I, I, I have a great pride in knowing that when I walk in somewhere, it's, it's a one of a kind thing that is being seen 
once again, you know, maybe she wore it back in the 1940s and she stuck it in the back of her closet and then I found it and now there's new life. And, um, and I think that's just a really romantic way of thinking about, you know, picking things from estate sales in people's houses. It is very romantic. And Melissa Fonzio, I would recommend you not to go to this uh, real estate sales this Saturday at oh. 7 a.m. because there is something happening in Atlanta, Georgia, which is a hurricane called Ian. Yes, yes. Thank you for the reminder. Um, we're, <laughs> we're, we're actually watching the hurricane. We have uh, family down in Florida. And so they've been evacuating from, um, you know, the Tampa Bay area all day. And we've been watching to see, you know, they call them um, spaghetti models, right? The, like, they have different lines of where they think that, you know, it may go the, the hurricane. And so it looks like a whole bunch of spaghetti. And so now the spaghetti models are coming together and they think that it's going to hit just below um, Tampa and it's going to be pretty fierce. And you're right. You know, it's going to go right over um, Florida, right into Georgia, and we're going to get some of that rain. So thank you. Uh, a good reminder not to go estate sale hunting on Saturday morning. Absolutely. It is better to wait a couple weeks before going again to collect, as you just mentioned, those uh, vintage purses, dresses, jewelries, and also mid-century uh, boardwear. And actually, since the beginning, we mentioned a very powerful word, which is Atlanta, because have you ever wondered why Atlanta rhymes with Melissa? <laughs> no, no one has ever pointed that out to me. Um, I do know that Melissa means honeybee. Um, and I'm sure there's a story by, by, behind Atlanta where that came from. But unfortunately, I don't have that in my file of facts of mind. Those two uh, meteorites collide and cannot live without each other. Aww. And it is always fascinating to observe them uh interacting with each other yeah i've been interacting with atlanta for a very long time my <laughs> mother's my, my, my mother's um parents my my granddaddy and my grandmother mimi retired here in 1972 my granddaddy was in the air force and my my grandmother obviously you know they went around the world um together and when he retired they bought a house here in atlanta to be closer to family and so all of my life even when you know, maybe my mom and my dad and I were living somewhere else. Atlanta has always been home base. And so it's been very special to me. And I've been lucky enough to have, um, along with my brother, you know, our family home here from, from our grandparents to our parents and now to us after our parents have now passed. And we've been able to see, um, in Atlanta how the city has grown. Um, Victor, have you ever been to Atlanta? I haven't been, uh, to Atlanta yet. Well, there's, um, there's some highway systems here that are that are very at, at a time can be very confusing. And there was a time where um, we have this Highway 85 and Highway 75, and at a time they didn't meet, and that was a long time ago. And I remember when you had to like go completely around the city because 75 and 85 never had the merge in the middle of the city. And so it's amazing to have. Um, you know, a child's memory of where you live and then the adult experience of living in the same place. Absolutely. And uh, Melissa Ponzio, there is something very ironic when I uh, try to have a overview of your journey since the very beginning, which is that your debut movie in uh, 1999 is actually called Atlanta Blue. Oh, so many people are going to be excited that you actually looked that up. Yes, Atlanta Blue. That was an independent feature film that was shot here. Um, a lot of uh, Atlanta local actors were in it. My partner, Kenny Alfonso. I don't know why I'm pointing as if he's in the corner here, but um, he was in it. And uh, we got to work together and a lot of our friends were in it. And it is it's it, it was a crazy time. It was a crazy, wonderful time. You know, a lot of actors have... You know, when they're starting out, 
Um, they do all these, you know, crazy independent films or, um, you know, spec films, and you don't really know what you're signing up for. And um, it can be a really great exercise because you really have no expectations of, of what the final product's going to be or if the final product will ever be really edited and put out there. And so you just go all out. And Atlanta Blue was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, it was probably shot here for maybe three or four weeks. And um, to his credit, you know, the, the producer director actually got it um, edited and it's out there. And um, if you find it, let me know so I can burn it. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that <laughs> last line. Why are you saying that about this uh, piece of art written and directed by David Hivener? Well, you know, it is a piece of art. You're absolutely right about that. I think everybody, you know, I, I can't speak for everyone. But a lot of myself and a lot of people that I know are very kind of sensitive to also the first thing that they, you know, put out there, so to speak. You know, you, I haven't watched that film in years and I can't remember if I'm good in it or not. But, you know, you're not as seasoned and maybe you don't make the same choices. And, you know, maybe maybe it's 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 not the experience that you remember. Um, but what I remember is just having a lot of fun with my friends. And really, that's. You know, if, if you can be in this industry and you're lucky enough to have any longevity in this industry and you're lucky enough then to work with people that you really respect and love, that's that's the gift. That's the gift of being an actor. I think, Melissa Ponzio, that we shouldn't try to burn, as you just <laughs> said, that f movie because you just mentioned uh, that you met your partner because it is the moment where Mona meets Cooper. Ah, that's right. Yeah, okay, we're not going to burn it. We're going to keep it on a shelf. We're going to put it in a hermetically sealed box so it'll be safe for posterity <laughs> forever. I might have a copy of it, you never know. Absolutely, and I just mentioned those two names, uh, which were the names of your character and the one of your husband. That's right. So Monine and Cooper. Yes, I remember it clearly. Um, you know, my partner Kenny, he's an expert marksman, and so he was on set, um, you know, he was doing gun safety as well as acting in the film and keeping everybody safe. and. Uh, It was just a lot of fun, just a lot of fun here in Atlanta. And if I understood correctly, Melissa Ponzio, during that same time and decades, you were shifting from another domain, which was uh, the news, uh, by being what we call a newscaster. Can you tell us about this very specific moment? Absolutely. Um, so I went to school here in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to um, a two-year college, and then I finished my last two years at Georgia State University. I always like to say Panthers number one. Um, that's <laughs> <laughs> when I went there, we actually didn't have uh, really any kind of uh, sports program, but you know, I'll go with the flow. Panthers number one. Um, and I gra when I graduated, I graduated with a um, a major in journalism and a minor in theater because my mom always said that I needed to be employed and to be able to pay for health insurance. And so, um, you know, and I thought that I would always be able to do that with a journalism degree. And I had an internship here at the CBS affiliate um, from, let me see, I want to say maybe from 90, 92, 92 to 94. And then I worked from 94 to 97, actually. And I was something called an assignment editor. And for those of you, just a, a quick, you know, definition of what an assignment editor is. That's the person that's kind of like the nervous system of the newsroom. They're the ones that are in constant contact with the news director, with the producers, with all of the reporters, all of the photographers. We're in charge of breaking news. We're in charge of relationships in the community so that if we find out something's going on that someone might give us a tip. We're watching all of the news channels at once to see if local news is breaking in with breaking news, if there's a house fire, if there's some type of traffic emergency. Um, we're responsible for, for gathering all of the news and presenting it to the people that are then going to um, mold it and, and write it and put it together editing and then put it on the air for, for you to see. So it was a very fast paced, crazy, crazy time. I was able to work during the um, Atlanta Olympics in 1996. 
There was a very famous um, news case here, the Susan Smith trial um, that happened here in the Southeast. Not to mention all just the crazy stuff that happens every day in Atlanta. I mean, Atlanta is a very busy metropolis. But at some point, um, you know, I had been acting in Atlanta. And so, you know, I was I was tr getting people to cover my shifts at the television station. And I was actually getting bigger and better parts. And it came to the point where I kind of needed to make a decision. And, uh, you know, I talked with my mom about it. And she was like, all right, maybe it's time. And so um, I quit the news station and I started acting full time. And lucky for me, each year um, I was able to apply myself to bigger and better projects. And, and you know, casting directors started trusting me. And um, and so it kind of took off from there. And, um, you know, here we are many, many moons later. And um, I'm very grateful and thankful for all the opportunities along the way that brought me here to be able to forward all these paper kites and bring them home from all these different places. Um, because without this work, I, I wouldn't have had this journey and all these different locations and different projects and meeting different people and, you know, trying to be um, a better storyteller with each project. Being a better storyteller with each project. And Melissa Ponzio, I truly believe that those early days was uh, probably one of the most important moments of your life because this is what made you uh, today. And this is also very funny because now as an actress, you are sometimes in a situation where you are playing a newscaster or yes! a journalist. Yes, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, it's kind of fun because, uh, you know, you know, there's the normal cadence of somebody talking and then there's the normal cadence of somebody talking when they're a newscaster. <laughs> and I watch so many news programs that you can just kind of, um, you know, drop into it. There's there's definitely like a I'm the authority on what's going on here. Let's go back to you in the studio, John, um, <laughs> that you see people do. And it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to like pretend what I used to do for a living. I'm sure it would be true if like there's an actor who was just a heart surgeon five years ago. I mean, then to be a surgeon on, um, you know, on the resident, they're like, dude, I got this. I, I know how to do heart transplants. It's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And Melissa Ponzio, uh, during this one decade from uh, 2000 to uh, 20. Uh, 10 during um, this uh, what we can call a slow trajectory what would you say were your biggest lessons that is a really good question Victor when we were talking earlier I told you um, and I'm so glad that you brought it up that it was a very slow trajectory you know some people you know, they start out and they get that one role and it just catapults them to the top. And all of a sudden they're in a different stratosphere. They're, they have different choices to make. Um, they have, you know, different opportunities. And, you know, for, for a lot of people, it's more like this. It's kind of like a plane taking off at a, at a diagonal, you know, and maybe it drops a little bit and it goes up a little bit. Um, and it's just steady work. And, you know, for people that ever, whoever started maybe in uh, not a top market like Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, when you're talking, you know, Atlanta, Louisiana, Wilmington, North Carolina, Miami, um, you know, it's, it's a lesson in patience because you have to be ready and willing and able and, and wanting to do the work that's in your area that is available to you. And so there were there were times that were very lean, and then there were times that were gangbusters. You know, we um, when I say we, the collective we here in the South, um, starting out, you know, there there's not always the, the there wasn't always the hustle and bustle of film and television. Sometimes it was the hustle and bustle of doing you know commercials and doing corporate training videos, corporate training videos where a company might need someone to you know, teach them about um, sexual harassment in the workplace or, you know, the new insurance for the next year coming up or how to mop the floors here at McDonald's. Like, you know, those kinds of training films, uh, they need people that really can 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 tell the story of, of how to work here and what's coming up. And that's a, that's a different set of acting skills. And so when you ask about, you know, the beginning of somebody's career, I think, you know, whether it's in a big industry town or not, 
it's it's patience. It's knowing that something bigger and better is coming on and knowing that the job that you have before you is the most important job and you need to do it well and you need to do it so that people can depend on you next time and they know that you have a good work ethic and that you're going to be happy and you're going to know your lines and you you do all those really small things because um victor i believe and i've had conversations with other actors you know for any given project there are hundreds if not thousands of people that are being looked at for any particular role and then through a series of events maybe it's it's whittled down and maybe they're looking at eventually maybe 10 or 12 people. And then it gets down to the last three. Sometimes, not always, there's many factors that go into it, but sometimes the biggest, <laughs> the biggest factor is who do we want to work with? Who do we want to you know, show up with every single day and who's going to be committed and who's going to lead the pack and who's going to, who's going to, uh, you know, if it's going to be a long day, not complain about it. Who, who do we know? How do, how do we feel out these people to know that it's going to be a good experience for the longevity of what the project is? And that's what I aim for. I aim to not only be a person that brings, the, you know, obviously the acting skill set, but I aim to be the person that they want to work with. That's very important to me. My reputation as, as, a, as a professional coming in to your project. Furthermore, Melissa Ponzio, you went from Atlanta blue to Atlanta red. Let me explain. Red <laughs> is the color of the uh, danger on road signed, exactly like the dangerous triangle, which is Teen Wolf, The Walking <laughs> Dead and Chicago Fires. That is a very dangerous triangle. I love how you pulled that together, Victor. That was very good. Bravo. Um, yeah, it's it's. Um, I think it's a lesson in when it rains, it pours. There was a there was a time not too long ago. Um, you know, if I had to look in the memory banks, it was probably 2013, 14, 15, where those three projects actually were filming at this almost at the same time. They overlapped, and. Um, and that was a very exciting time. Not, not every actor gets to be on one show, let alone three shows at any given moment in, in their career. And so I was very lucky that, um, you know, people got on the phone with one another and worked out dates. You know, producers were able to work out so that I could be somewhere Monday, Tuesday, get on a flight Wednesday and then shoot Thursday, Friday and then flip around and go back. And, you know, it was a, it was a very exciting time and I was very grateful to have it. And each one of those projects are, are very different. Um, but the constant thread is that they are there. The cast and crew is a family when you get there and they are very, all three are very warm and welcoming. And, um, and I was very lucky to be a part of that and hopefully will continue to be a part of that for as long as, you know, at least Chicago fire and teen wolf. I mean, you know, I got the ax on walking dead, so can't come back from that. You just told me that, uh, <laughs> Each casting crew is a family in itself, mm -hmm. which means that you had at least four family, which represents hundreds of people and a lot of names to remember. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and usually I say, hey, honey, how you doing? What's up, sweetheart? How's it going? Those are my names. <laughs> Hi, how you doing, honey? Good to see you. Absolutely. And all of those projects were overlapping and there is one that is going to be continued uh, very soon in the future which is a movie uh, the movie of Teen Wolf can you tell us a little bit more about what is going to happen on Paramount Plus well we're very excited um, you know when we finished our sixth season of Teen Wolf we knew that going into into the sixth night season that it was going to be our last. And so as a cast and a crew and as creatives, we tried to really soak up every moment, really enjoy um, each other's company and really have a lot of fun in hopes that maybe one day MTV might have us back or we might see something different. And so here we are years later, you know, last year, 
Um, some of us were lucky enough to get the call from Jeff Davis of, hey, if, if, if this thing gets greenlit, would you, would you come back and would you be able to come back? And, you know, we, we able, we were able to get a lot of the original cast, some, some old, some new. Um, and, you know, it was a really wonderful experience to come back. As I shared earlier um, with you, we had some time where we shot in Los Angeles on the original stages. And then we actually came back here to Atlanta to shoot for um, a little over a month. And so that was really exciting. Some may or may not know that when Teen Wolf actually originated, the first two seasons were shot here in Atlanta. And then the production got part of the tax incentive out of in California and they moved it out there for seasons three through six. So, you know, it started in Atlanta, went out to California, you know, and we, we finished strong with the television show, and then it kind of bounced back from Los Angeles back to Atlanta for the movie. And we're really proud of, of what the script is and what the story is. You know, Jeff Davis and the writers, they had a lot of rich material over six seasons to pull from. Um, you know, Beacon Hills is a big world, and a lot has happened. Um, there's a lot of of relationships, there is a lot of um, action. There is a lot of events. There's a lot of people that that they could pull from, and a lot of story, a lot of story. And I think that they had, they did a wonderful job of trying to honor as much of the history of the television show in the movie, and maybe even leave it open, maybe for a second, third, fourth. 10th installment. I mean, that would be the wish, right? That we just keep going and going. Um, and it's really exciting just to be able to have this one movie out there for people to enjoy. Um, who, the, the one thing that I also, without giving anything away spoiler wise, people who, who watched Teen Wolf will love it. And then people who have no exposure to Teen Wolf, I think will love it because it, it, it it's on its own as well as pulling from you know, the history of Teen Wolf as we know it. This is the wish, Melissa Ponzio. And that being said, everyone on this planet is happy about this movie, <laughs> except one thing, one animals, which Ooh. is Sophia, your dogs, because more oh. work means less time with this uh, creature. Yes, um, for those who know, Sophie, Sophie, my 110 pound polar bear dog, she is very attached to me and she, uh, she and everyone that she allows near her, she, she's kind of fearful and when, when she gets scared, it kind of, kind of can come off as aggression. So she, she looks like a big beast, but really she's a softie at heart and, uh, and she doesn't like it when I go away. She doesn't like it at all, but she had to put up with it while we shot the movie and, and I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll have to give her some extra treats if we if we do a second one so that she can wait at home for me while we, we shoot the long days. Absolutely. And Melissa Ponzio, I would love to make a little focus on that original movie. You just mentioned that it would be a completely uh, new story so that, for example, people who haven't watched uh, the hundreds of episodes could understand the storylines. Um, this is a new chapter. Yes, it is a new chapter. I was actually um, talking with someone about it actually today, and it's really interesting. I don't think that this is a spoiler, but we're meeting our characters sometime <laughs> in the future, right? And so when we, when we stopped shooting, we were one age in the television show. And now that we've picked it back up for the movie, we have progressed in, in, in the time of Beacon Hills. And so now um, we're meeting people maybe in new jobs, maybe in new places, maybe in new relationships, maybe in, um, you know, in, in repair of maybe uh, their, their own legacy on the show or maybe in disrepair of their legacy. And, and that was really interesting to uh, be a part of. And so, yeah, we're, we're being reintroduced to these characters in a new way. And so that's why I say if someone had never seen Teen Wolf, you'll be able to start to finish to, to really understand who these characters are, how they're intertwined, and also, um, you know, Beacon Hills and, and, and the power of, the, of, of that town and what that means. Absolutely, Melissa Ponzio, because usually by making a film, we have two choices, whether to make 
a skip in time, so explaining what is going on afterward in the future, or making a prequel, explaining the backstory of your character. That's right, and I'm and I'm glad um, <laughs> that they they chose the the former rather than the latter because I don't know if I would have been able to pull off a younger me. So I'm glad that they were able <laughs> to pull off an older me. <laughs> I could pull off an older me. Um, and that's, that's interesting. Yeah. It's, it's fun. You know, Victor, it's just a lot of fun to have, uh, you know, grown up with the kids, you know, mm. the, these young people that they were, some of them had had a couple of projects underneath their belt. Um, and then in some, some, this was their first thing. And so when you talk, when you, when you see these, you know, my fellow actors and they, and they've gone on to be, you know, um, Superman, so to speak, and they've gone on to be movie stars and they've gone on to, uh, you know, musical projects and to see them just grow and progress as these beautiful humans that they are. It's, it's really wonderful. It's a really wonderful experience. Melissa Ponzio, thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And I love your laugh. I need to come back on and just make you laugh. We need to all just make you laugh. <laughs>